Let's start solving one simple example of our energy eigenvalue equation in the position representation. So to remind you, we have our operator, which will be our Hamiltonian, applied to a function. And in this case, these are our energy eigenfunctions. We'll get a specific energy out and that function back. So now, in general, our Hamiltonian is going to be this first term coming from kind of the kinetic energy or momentum operator, and then the potential. So in order to do anything here, we have to make an assumption about potential. Let's choose the free particle, okay? So now that we have a specific version, we can plug that in. So now, that's just going to set v of x equals to zero. So now I'm going to take this version and I'm going to rewrite it. So I have negative h bar squared over 2m d dx of my functions. And to try to just simplify this a little bit, I'm going to write that this special wave function I'm looking for, it's just f of x. It's some function that I'm trying to figure out. So d dx, oop, I've also lost a squared, haven't I? This should be second derivative. Okay, second derivative of f of x is going to now equal some energy f of x. Now I'm going to rearrange and then do some renaming. Again, the goal here is to understand what we're trying to do. And if you haven't had differential equations before, there's a bit of a jump that you have to make here. So I can flip this upside down, move it to the other side. So I'm left with my second derivative of my function, and this is going to be one dimensional, is equal to negative 2mei over h bar squared f of x. Now, that seems kind of messy. So I'm going to rewrite this as ci. And I'm going to keep the index here because the idea being that there were going to be multiple functions that we're solving for. Each one corresponds to its own energy. So to remember this, I'm just going to keep the sub i here. If you have the habit of having messy handwriting where that i gets too big and you start to think that means square root of negative 1, call this c sub k, whatever you want. So we're now left with my second derivative of this function. And again, single variable, one dimensional function is equal to negative ci times that function. The whole goal right now is to figure out what this function must be. Now, if we take the second derivative of, for instance, x squared. First derivative would give us 2x. Second derivative would give us 2. Clearly, the second derivative then is not proportional to the function itself. So what type of function will actually be, once you've taken its second derivative, proportional to itself? Well, there's two ways to think about this. And it really comes from this minus sign. You either need a complex exponential, or you can write this as sine and cosine. So let's first do it this way. Let's say that f of x equals a cosine, and I'm going to keep this a general, kx plus b sine of kx. So when I take my first derivative, so df dx, when I take my derivative of cosine, that's going to become negative sine. But then this k comes out, so I have negative a k sine of k of x, and then when I take the derivative of sine, I get cosine. Again, that uh, k comes out, so b cosine kx. Now I take this, I take my second derivative, and so sine of kx will give me that cosine again. Another factor of k comes out, so negative a k squared, sorry, cosine kx. And then cosine becomes negative sine, so negative b k again squared, second factor comes out, sine of kx. So if you look, a cosine kx, I have a cosine kx, b sine kx, b sine kx. So I get to rewrite this now as my second derivative of this original function is going to be equal to negative k squared of itself, right? I had this function here, both terms have a negative k squared. So when we see this, we go, hey, this worked. For real, one of the valid ways of solving a differential equation like this, and the idea of a differential equation is that you don't know what the function is, but you know how its derivatives relate to itself, how its changes relate to itself. 
Well, you guess and check. So we just guessed and checked. And honestly, this is going to work because there's just not that many different solutions we're going to see. So now when you guess, you have to guess a general enough case. So for instance, if I had left out this K, it, I wouldn't have ended up with anything here. If I had called this K1 and K2, we would have gotten to this point and seen that it only would have worked had K1 and K2 actually been the same, to have one constant here. If you forget these coefficients out front, well, you're going to have a problem and things won't be normalizable. So we're left with this. So based on this, what I see is that K must equal my square root of CI. So I can now say that the function that I have found that satisfies this energy eigenvalue, so again, this was my phi of e sub i of x, right? I just rewrote it so it looks less scary, is going to be equal to a cosine of now inside square root of ci. But now remember that ci was this big thing. So this is actually equal to square root of 2m e i over h bar squared. So cosine of 2m e sub i over h bar squared x. And then I'm going to have my second term, which was plus b sine of that thing then, 2m e sub i h bar squared x. Now, it's gone a little bit off the screen, but the idea being that we have different e sub i's which are basically changing the wavelength. You can think of this as changing the wavelength of this wave function or changing how it's oscillating in space. So in this case, I solved it with cosine and sine. You can also actually solve it with um, e, to the i, e to the i theta x, where again, you're gonna get constraints on, on theta. You'll have to have a positive one and a negative one. Notice here that we have two unknowns and you would use the boundary conditions to figure those out. So this was meant to just go through the process. Key step one, know what your potential is. You really can't do anything with this if you don't know what your potential is. Step two then was actually to solve the differential equation, which is going to be a big part of what we're doing. But once I've solved it for this, this is always going to be what the solution is. So even though the step of solving the differential equation might seem intimidating, it's really not something that there's a lot of different answers to. It's like once you learn the alphabet, you know the alphabet, but the first time you learn the alphabet, it's hard because it's new. So don't be too intimidated by this, but that's the, the general process of finding out what these are. We would then need other information to figure out what the values of energy can be. And in fact, we can't really do that for the free particle. We can actually have any value of energy here. So the free particle one is easy to solve, but we don't get all of the boundary conditions that we need. And that's why the infinite square well is actually the best one for us to start with, since then we have boundary conditions that can enforce this a little more.